A very good morning to you, Brumley Baptist Church. Hope that you are doing well and that you've had a good week to this point. We are glad to have you along on this Sunday morning as we continue on our study through the book of Proverbs. We've been talking about the way of wisdom uh, for several weeks now, and we've made our way all the way to Proverbs, the 23rd chapter. And we're going to spend some time to the, spend some time, excuse me, there today. If you have your quarterly with you, we're in session number nine. The title this morning is Staying Sober. Staying Sober. So we're going to look at what God's Word has to say to us about that, and we're certainly glad that you've joined us along here today. Let's jump into the Scripture. I hope you've enjoyed our study of Proverbs as much as I have. I will be completely honest with you. Uh, I didn't know how I felt about this, just because Proverbs is different than my normal style of preaching. Uh, those of you here at Brumley know that I like to go through a book and go a verse at a time and build on context and do that sort of thing. And Proverbs is not written like that. It is simply written from one proverb or one idea to the next, and it never it has thematic areas, but you really have to kind of jump around for those sort of things as it goes just straight up and down Scripture. Uh, it talks about wisdom, but it talks about different aspects of it, and the, a lot of times verses aren't necessarily connected to one another. However, uh, having said all that, I have I really enjoyed it. It has been uh, a very enjoyable study, uh, at least to me it has. I, I pray that it has been to you. We have two more weeks in it. Uh, after this week on the 9th of August, we'll be in Proverbs 29, and then on the 16th of August, Lord willing, We'll be in Proverbs 31, looking at the godly woman of wisdom, and then we'll spend two weeks in the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs and look at a couple passages there as well, and that'll finish out our summer series, and then we'll be looking at fall quarterlies. Can you imagine that? The fall is just around the corner. Today, though, staying sober. What does that mean, and what does that mean from the Scripture? And this is a really interesting study, and I want us to to look at it, and we're going to do so in four parts. And the first one of those here is the promise. And it starts in verse 17 and 18. Again, we're in Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs 23, 17 says, Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Um, this is This is a great starting point, even though it's at the beginning or excuse me, even though it's in the middle of this chapter, because I think verse 17 is sort of a summary verse for basically everything we're going to talk about today. In the New American Standard, it says, do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. That's really what we should be doing. Instead of looking around and looking at what other people get to do, or the quote-unquote privileges that other people have who are not followers of the Lord, or you know, the things that they engage in, you know, if we're honest, our sinful flesh looks at them sometimes and says, you know, well, I'd love to be doing those things. I wish I had the the freedom that they had to go live this way or to go live that way. But that's really not, not what we were after. If you think about the decisions in life that your kids or grandkids are going to have to make, you may have the same fear that Solomon had. Solomon is writing here in Proverbs 23, trying to tell his son, those people who would come behind him to not do some of the things that he did, not make some of the mistakes that he had made. Um, They work to influence their kids, just like parents and grandparents work today to influence their kids. But still, look what it says here in verse 17. Don't let your heart envy sinners. The the sinful, wicked heart, apart from Jesus, is still going to, to draw and kind of drift, maybe is a better word, toward these things of the world. And Solomon knows that. And so he wants to warn uh, his offspring, those who come behind him. He wants his children to have a heart for the Lord and not an envious heart towards sinners uh, or towards sin, maybe better said. And here's why. Look in verse 18. Surely there is a future and and your hope will not be cut off. Meaning if you follow the Lord, if you fear the Lord and walk in the way that the Lord wants you to walk, you have a future. You have a hope. You know, Satan does a really good job at dressing up sin in our culture and in Solomon's culture. It looks like it's this, and it looks like it's that. It looks like it gives all this joy and happiness and 
But all that stuff is just fleeting. We don't get the picture of where those sins take someone. Sin never fulfills what it says it will fulfill. It never gives you what it promises. It is full of empty promises. It says it'll give you joy and, and all the, and fulfillment and all this stuff, but it never does those things. It leaves you empty inside. It leaves you wanting more. It leaves you just with this great unfulfilled feeling that can't be replaced and that really can't be fixed or helped. That's what sin does. And so Solomon says the way of wisdom is to be sober, not to, not to envy what they have, but to lament that, that they have what they have. So that's the promise. Here is the promise stated. If you continue in the fear of the Lord, there's a future and a hope for you. Christian, no matter what happens in the world we live in, if you continue to walk with the Lord, there's a hope for us. And that hope is found only, only in the person of Jesus Christ and only in the future that he promises to give us. And we are so thankful for that and that promise that we have. The lost don't have that. Which leads us to, secondly, the petition. So since that's the promise, here's what Solomon says, the petition, verse number 19. I'm going to read out the New American Standard. You have the ESV there on your screen. Listen, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Do not be heavy drinkers of wine, or with gluttoners, gluttonous excuse me, eaters of meat. For the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. So here's the petition. You overindulge in food. You overindulge in alcohol. You allow those things to control you instead of walking in the fear of the Lord. And look what he says in verse 21. Here's what will happen. You'll end up clothed with rags. Again, alcohol, drugs, addiction of any kind, overeating, trying to self-medicate with any of these things the world offers us never comes to anything good, never comes to anything positive. And scripture speaks about that. Over and over and over again, Proverbs 23, we're warned against gluttony in verses 1 through 3. In Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 35, we're warned against alcohol. 1 Corinthians 5.11 warns us against alcohol. Job 12.25 warns us against alcohol. Uh, Hosea 4.11 tells us that alcohol will mess up our thinking and not allow us to think straight. Noah gets drunk in Genesis chapter 9 and brings shame upon himself and his whole family. Over and over and over, we could look at these. Ephesians 5, don't be drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible is really clear about what alcohol abuse can do to someone. Many of you could give testimony to what alcohol abuse has done to your friends or to your family. So anything that controls us, and he says in these verses, food can do that, alcohol can do that, drugs can do that, seeking riches or fame or fortune or power or prestige can do that. Men and women work themselves to death to provide things for their family. What their family really needs is that person, not material things. So anytime that we're driven by anything except our love for the Lord, there's trouble waiting around the bend. There's problems that are always, always associated with that. So Solomon here gives the petition, and here's his petition. Look in verse 19. Hear my son and be wise. Listen, my son, and be wise. And he says, direct your heart in the way. So hear the words and then apply those words to your heart and let your heart then, once it's influenced by the word of God, tell you which way you should go. That, that's what the admonition is here. That, yeah, listen to your heart, but you can't listen to your heart until the word of God has effected it and affected it. And maybe we could even go further and say infected it when it's really inside there. That's our petition. That, that's Solomon's petition for his kids and for his offspring, those who come after him. And that would be the same thing we would say for those who come after us. Be filled with the, the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Don't follow your own heart. And then here's the portrait. Here's what comes of that. Verse 29. Again, I'll read New American Standard. You have ESV on your screen. Read through verse 32. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long over wine. Those who go to taste mixed wine. Do not look at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. And at last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. In the end, 
the ESV says, or at the last, and the American Standard says, this is the portrait, this is what happens. Again, wine looks pretty. Sin always presents itself as something desirable to us. If it didn't, we wouldn't struggle with it. We wouldn't have problems with it. But it, it always presents itself that way. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that when Eve looked at the fruit and saw that it was pleasing to the eye, that's where sin begins. When it starts to draw us and it draws on our senses. I hear people say that, well, I got to get home and I got I to gotta have a drink just to take the edge off. Or I just want a social drink, go out with my friends and have a good time. Or I just need this or need that. Or uh, lately, it's been with stay-at-home moms on social media. They've started things that mommy needs some wine. You need to leave mommy alone because she needs wine at the end of the day. My question to all these would be, why? Why do you need to take the edge off with alcohol? Why do you just need to have alcohol or some other substance to make you have a good time or an enjoyable time? What? Why do we need to add these things in order to then enjoy ourselves or to be normal or to just be content? Christian, why do we need to add things to the joy of the Lord that the Bible says should be our strength? See, this is the portrait of what someone who does that. Notice what he says. He says, you have woe, sorrow, strife, complaining, wounds without cause, red eyes. So those people that, that look like they've been through difficulty, here's what they've been through. They've, they've been through wine. They've been through alcohol. They see it in the cup. They look at it. They think it'll help them. And in the end, it says... It bites like a serpent. It bites like a serpent. Stings like a viper. That, that's not what we would want for any of our kids. None, none of us would think, well, I hope my kids play around with that snake for a little while. Yeah, it's poisonous, but it probably won't bite them. And we do the same thing with alcohol. We know what the Bible says. It'll bite them in the end. So why will we play around with it any more than we would play around with a venomous snake? That's what the Word of God tells us. Lastly, it leads us to this, the problem. In verse 33, your eyes will see strange things. Your mind will utter perverse things. You'll be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea. You're like one who lies down on the top of a mast. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. Isn't this a sad end to someone? When someone becomes addicted, when someone gets hooked or snared by some of these sinful vices, this is where it leads them. They see strange things. They utter perverse things in their heart. The, the picture in verse 34 is like someone who's doing something completely foolish, trying to lay down in the ocean or up on top of the mast of a ship, a place they don't belong, a place they would never lie down unless they've been heavily influenced by something else that had taken over their thoughts and taken over their mind. That, that's what Ephesians 5 is about. Don't be drunk with wine. Why? Because it controls you. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit can control you. We're taking anything into our body that is giving up our control. We're losing the self-control. We're losing the spirit control. And we are sinning against the Word of God. That's what the New Testament teaches. We're giving that control away, whether it be to, to a drug, whether it's legal or illegal, whether it be to alcohol, which is legal and kills hundreds of thousands of people every year. No one bats an eye. These are vices. These are things that worm their way into our hearts and to our lives, and they destroy us from within. And this is where someone ends up. This is the problem. This is why Solomon writes and tells his offspring, don't go down this path, because this is where it leads. And then verse 35 describes addiction. It's struck, but not hurt, beat, but not feeling it. And then he says well, at the end, when shall I wait? I must have another drink. They go right back to that, which caused them so much harm and so much pain. That's what addiction is. It is a real thing. I mean, it is a psychological, biological, physiological thing. It's a spiritual thing as well. Addiction has ruined many, many countless numbers of lives. And so the wisdom literature here in the book of Proverbs tells us to not go down that road don't ever handle or play with that snake because its end is ruin and it's not a place we ever want to go. So I pray that we would heed that warning and learn something from that as we study this together today. I so appreciate you joining me for a few minutes as we've studied the Proverbs together this morning in Proverbs 23 and the biblical admonition to stay sober.
pray that you'll join us live 10 a.m. on Sunday morning as we'll broadcast on YouTube and Facebook live from our morning services. Love for you to have you join us as well in person at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning if you have opportunity to do that as well. Until I may see you again, the Lord bless and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. And until we meet again, I pray that you would go serve your king. Have a good and godly day.